head through the, the final session. Um, I've asked them to leave the food in the back until we're finished, so, uh, so don't feel that you need to go racing back there to, to grab something. Uh, you, can, you can get it on your way out. In fact, you could probably get quite a lot on your way out, um, but, but at any rate. Um, so uh, you, you may have noticed that uh, we sent around the, the slides from last night uh, to everybody. I got a few comments back from some erstwhile uh, folks who were um, uh, looking at their email at, uh, late at night uh, and would I welcome. There were uh, Blackhawks fans trying to uh, get over the Tampa victory, <laughs> but uh, we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, Tampa, eh? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but at any rate. Hockey town, it, US. It won't, it won't happen again. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, so what I what I did was just to, to show in yellow because you know I'm I'm, I'm a color oriented person uh, to show in yellow the things that have changed from the six panels that you saw previously and and again we'll send this around the the only um, uh, uh, real changes here were uh, in addition to need criteria for quality and types of evidence that we should support oh this was the uh, the mandate question um, that we should you know we should mandate as it were uh, uh, identification of types of evidence across these programs and it seemed like uh, maybe calling that supporting or encouraging or whatever would be better. Um, and then it was suggested, and, and we uh, wholeheartedly agree, uh, developing collaborative projects with Genome Canada and, and other groups, but particularly Genome Canada, Pierre, um, we, would, we would love to have the chance to do, so that would be great. Um, there was a, a point made that, uh, that we should have an emphasis in structure similar to the emphasis that we've uh, traditionally placed on sharing genotypes for sharing phenotypes, because we're currently at a, at a space where we really need the phenotypes to be able to understand the genotypes. Um, having said that, the complexities involved in, sh in sharing phenotypes, I, I did not appreciate it. So I'm, I was trained as a cardiovascular epidemiologist, and we used to share blood pressures and lipid data and all, all that all the time, um, and, it, and it really wasn't a big concern. When it, comes to somebody's actual medical record, there are big concerns there, particularly um, having to do with identifiability, but also a lot of regulations and statutes around HIPAA and, and what what's can be shared and what can't. Um, and so, so the challenges involved in that are, are not trivial. And just kind of wondered from, from this group, what, you know, what do you see as NHGRI's potential contribution in the sharing phenotypes area other than to tell everybody they have to do it? I mean, are there, there are ways we can facilitate that? Um, I think that uh, perhaps participating in discussions about safe harbor, that under what circumstances can it be shared and under what conditions, I think we, that, that's the sort of thing that, that needs to be done. Um, and um, I don't think it's something that NHGRI can do on its own, but it, you might be able to facilitate discussions on uh, creations of safe harbors so that uh, there, there's at least a, a level playing field for an, an understanding. So, so could I ask, because not everybody is familiar with that term, um, and, and not, not all of us use it in the correct way, perhaps, could you define it for us? So uh, this is certainly not a definitive uh, definition, and I can't get to Wikipedia fast enough, but um, <clears throat> a, a safe harbor would be a situation under which uh, data which usually could not be uh, shared under certain rules, regulations, legislation, whatever. Uh, is allowed to be shared under certain set of conditions. Um, and that basically uh, having those, if you meet those sets of conditions, uh, then you can um, uh, uh, share without fear of uh, liability or, or other protected. sorts of legal, it's a protected type of thing. And so um, <clears throat> this is not a perfect analogy, but we heard talk about FISMA uh, compliance. Uh, and, and FISMA is a set of, um, uh, it's a certification process and a set of rules under which if somebody can collect data, uh, so the Newborn Screening Translational Research Network is a FISMA compliant repository which allows them to collect uh, data and hold it under a certain um, uh, a set of uh, regulations and policies and procedures that provides a safe harbor for the sharing and use of that data. And Alexa, you, you have some familiarity with that. It's FISMA compliant, right? I understand that the UDN is FISMA compliant because it, it takes data from an NIH program, from, it takes federal data. Exactly right. But I think as we've, we've said in our discussions, um, it's probably that's going to be the way of the world going forward. So, so um, I'm, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity. So I think there's an assumption, for example, in dbGaP that 
all the data go up there, and in general, while there's some approval process, somebody can access and use those data without the involvement of the primary investigators. And, and I think the irony is that to access NIH-funded clinical trials, that's often not the case. And so, for example, we just put in a proposal that is not genetic related, but would use all-hat data. And the rules for accessing all-hat data was you had to have an all-hat investigator. <clears throat> and so I'm wondering if one of the solutions to the phenotype thing, which has in part to do with just getting the data up there, but a lot of times the, the phenotypic data, whether they're from a clinical trial or from electronic health record, they're very complex and they're not easily understood as a data set if you haven't been sort of part of that data generation. So, and, and I'm not sure that this is completely different um, from what Mark was saying, so that you put up what phenotypes are available or what kind of phenotypes might be available, but then someone would access those through a collaboration um, with, the, with the investigators at the site. So it's kind of a middle ground, mm -hmm. and it really more aligns, I think, with how data are shared from NIH-funded clinical trials. Well, it depends on the clinical trial and also the, the vintage of it. So, so All Hat was something that began in the, actually, the late 1990s. Um, so, it, you know, it, it really predated and in many ways helped us put pressure on, on some of the data sharing models. Um, but, but NHGRI, it, it, you know, tries very hard, you know, using the model of the Human Genome Project where there were absolutely no restrictions whatsoever on, on using it other than that you couldn't publish before other, other people and, and that. But, um, but, but basically, you know, I, I think trying to say, you know, to, to require people to have a collaboration just wouldn't, that's just not in our DNA, as it were. On the other hand, we, we, do, we do try to encourage collaboration, and, and when we began the GAIN project, which, you know, it was essentially GAIN genotyping, the Genetic Association Information Network, which was our first foray into genome-wide association studies, uh, and the Framingham study, again, their first foray into genotyping, were the, the impetus for putting dbGaP together. And, and when we did that, we said we, we don't want there to be any strings attached whatsoever, um, but we, you know, encouraged in the, in the design papers that described it and that you'll be much better off if you work with the investigators involved, if they're willing to work with you and they have the bandwidth and that sort of thing. So, so I think we, we may not be able to go quite that far, um, but, you know, it's good to think right. about. Right. And, and I, you know, I don't necessarily see it so much as being about the, the investigators I mean, I think, I think you have a lot better end product if the primary investigators are involved because they really understand the data. Um, but in all honesty, there's a lot of phenotypic data that's not on dbGaP um, because people are meeting their minimum requirements from the phenotype perspective. And, you know, for a variety of reasons of complexity and data sharing, um, there's more there. And so, you know, you just wonder, especially when you move into sort of talking about electronic health records, which clearly you couldn't put up, um, you know, whether there's a mechanism that makes it um, clear that there are additional data, phenotypic data that might be accessed, but it might take a special process that includes a data sharing agreement between the two institutions or whatever. Well, I think we had such a great conversation over these two days about phenotyping and about the, the different dimensions of, of challenges in phenotyping. And so, I mean, it, it's sort of self-evident, but taking a step back, NHGRI might, might want to look at supporting um, or uh, requesting people to do interesting experiments in how to collect these data. We've heard about, you know, novel ways to make value out of the EMR with all its warts. We've heard about patient reporting and what could galvanize that. We've heard about um, wearables in terms of automated and scalable phenotyping. And we've heard about gamification that some of the DTC companies are using to try to have an ongoing relationship. We, we, we know about the peer process, the peer platform, Chair and Terry is advocating for allowing people to granularly be involved, and and we heard about uh, the the PCORI stuff, which is which is deeply involving patients in the decision making process. So, you know, there's so many um, initiatives afoot, and I would think that sort of um, initiatives that sort of said, okay, we're going to compare these, or we're going to try this clever way of combining them would, would be really interesting before the world decides on stand, how to standardize 
phenotype collection. So just to bridge uh, the second and third bullet points on that slide, and Alexa might want to say something to this as well, is standardizing or, or continuing to support efforts to develop standards for describing phenotypes, especially in ways that allow crosswalks between human and model organisms. Um, I think that will be really important for variant interpretation and functional characterization and identifying variants that are going to be of real interest to the clinical community and finding the appropriate model organism systems in which to do the validation. So I don't know, Alex, if you want to say anything about that too. I, I want to support that. And I think that there's already, as we, as we said yesterday, there's already some interesting work going on uh, through the Monarch collaboration and, and others who have begun to look at this. And, you know, the idea being that you can, uh, you can you, there's more data for the model organisms than there is for the humans. And let's take advantage of that. But there's, there's work that needs to be done to do the appropriate translation and so on. So I think it fits with the comments uh, that uh, Robert has made as well. There really has been a lot of discussion about phenotyping in the last couple of days, and I would love to see some kind of emphasis on that. And, and you know, what's enough data? So you were saying, Julie, that there isn't enough data. You know, what counts as enough? We know what's too little often. But do we know how much we actually need in order to do the, the science uh, and looking for the outcomes? W I don't think we really know. I mean, so. Well, yeah, so, so there's a lot of sequencing going forward. <laughs> and the leverage is the sequencing, and there's value added to the phenotypes. And so there's lots of pressure that can be brought to bear to sequence that which is best phenotyped. The other issue that we kind of give lip service almost to is that we're a dynamic organism, and longitudinal data is incredibly important, but we've never come to grips with it. And I, I think, you know, there are ways of leveraging the sequencing in those resources that are already in freezers, um, lots of places. That we're not going to do it going forward so much, but we can do it going backwards because there are resources available. Broadening the, the sharing of phenotyping data, or encourage maximum, I and mean, we do that already, but maybe maybe putting a little more teeth in that, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I think <clears throat> this is a, a particularly ripe area for maybe GM9. In terms of the, the phenotypes that will be useful? To, to uh, use just, and how to, how to bring together the basic uh, model organism investigators together with human uh, model organism investigators and uh, think about best practices in terms of sharing phenotypes, think about how to structure the data in a way that it's, it's maybe even computable. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think all of those things seem to me like a great topic for a meeting. Yeah, I would uh, agree with that. And, and, and um, uh, you could imagine in, in fleshing out the meeting that you would have, as we talked about earlier today, some examples of uh, fruitful collaborations, but then taking some of the comments that have been made in this section and perhaps others to say, here are some, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, topic ideas where we want to uh, do more, have a more of an open discussion about how can we really do this, um, have somebody present, set up the topic, you know, uh, and then uh, have discussion around that. So I, I think that would be a very fruitful organization for that GM9 meeting. So, given that we'll be of GM9, yes. we can remember uh, that. Yes, I, I, Howard. Just, our problem is we need an institutional memory. <laughs> so, so, so I think along those lines that, that the, um, the other part of this is just not the basic research from the standpoint of knowledge base gaining, but I think the other part would be interesting is that can we learn to do this at speed that benefits patients? Right, because I think that's a very different um, endpoint than we want to get a paper or we want to get a grant. <clears throat> so I think that's another topic to add into this. Yeah, because it's not really. I think a basic scientist would not consider it basic science, because we're not looking at this zinc finger on this protein. We're looking at more of a translational uh, coming from the clinic into the ba and understanding mechanisms. So, it, you know, it's. I think we'll have to. Uh, get the right people there in order to answer the questions we want. You know, not, it's not just science for science's sake, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah. 
some of what oh yeah some of the, some of the, basic, some of the basic science, science yeah. would oh no they'll all surprise me but they but they may not call it, but they may not call it basic science <laughs> okay I just wanted to add, I think in that conversation, it would be worth bringing in industry into this because they have a very big foothold going forward. I mean, they're the ones that we're expecting to take forward the things that we're translating. So it would be good to be able to connect the R&D, the early, um, early clinical discovery phase that we're talking about here. Okay, that was topic one. So, so uh, no, actually that was topic two. So what, did I skip topic one? Uh, no, no, we talked about that. All right, so we've done two of them yeah. so far. Um, institutional memory. Institutional, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why I said you guys are you guys are hurting. Um, so, so anyway, uh, this was the the first of those slides. We also added um, uh, looking at the potential of crowdsourcing for phenotyping, um, which you know is is partly mobile technologies and other things. Uh, are there better ways of of doing that? Um, suggested over dinner, uh, could we find a way to add a family history tool? I mean, I think you know somebody suggested perhaps Jeff. Um, you know, should should NHGRI um, going forward not sequence anybody who didn't have three generations? pedigrees, I think he said that to be a bit provocative, but, um, but then became a, a, a little bit more focused to say, gee, wouldn't it be cool um, to have family history information on 20,000 sequenced people and, and really be able to then compare in a, in a you know, systematic way, what does the family history information add to the sequence? What does the sequence add to the family history? When are they, you know, you know how, how do we synergize them better, et cetera? Did I capture your thought? Kind of, so that institutional memory, it, was, you know, it comes and goes. So. Anyway, um, and that would be something that could be, could be done, you know, could almost be an add-on because family history, you know, you, you almost want to collect it as close in, as possible to the sequence so that, you know, sadly, as many people as possible have had events if they're going to have events. So, so that, that could be something that could be a, a relatively pain, painless add-on. Um, and then we talked about encourage more extensive data sharing and accelerate the uh, exploration um, to benefit patients. This did not change, so I'm going to flip through because we have three up. Oh, sorry. You want to change? Yes, we okay. I actually had the chance to think about this a little bit more. Okay. So for the first one, add a clinical trial type studies, uh, I wasn't very clear when I wrote that. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I think as part of the existing studies that are going on, the dynamic nature of data return is something that could be looked at. I think a lot of the projects were looking at it as first pass analysis, and then we have, well, what are we going to do across time? So I think just putting in some of the dynamic nature around this and looking to see what the impacts are, you know, Robert is in a better position than most to, to look at return of data and how people respond to this. But I think that's a question of the dynamic nature that can be handled across the board. And, and I would add to that, you know, I think, you know, we've, and we've talked about it a, a little bit, the, the question of re-annotation. And, you know, so I think, um, you know, places like Robert study working with ClinGen, you know, it would be interesting to look at examples of where somebody was, and I know there are a few examples, where somebody was given a result that says, we think that this is likely benign or this is likely pathogenic, and then that <clears throat> annotation has changed. So I think to really begin to learn what the consequences for the participants of that changed annotation is would really help inform us going forward about, you know, in general, how do we return results? That's a great idea for a question that could be practically asked across almost all of the sequencing consortia. It's also a very interesting question um, from a patient engagement perspective because obviously we're thinking about it uh, from the actionability perspective, but uh, we'd also want to say what's the impact on the patient of being, you know, told something different going forward? Is that perceived as useful, unuseful, harmful, um, I, I think that would be a really interesting uh, agenda, research and, agenda. And the physician engagement as well. What, what, what The physician that has to go through, presuming it might be involved non-geneticists, how, do, how does this uh, impact the way they think about genomic medicine and want to practice genomic medicine after something like that changes? I, mean, I, I personally can't think in, in clinical practice of any other field where we, you know, a year, two years later, we get a report saying, oh, you know, we have a better way of analyzing the x-ray, um, and, and there was a brain tumor or, or something like right. that. So. Okay. So it, it, <laughs> I, th I think the scale of the problem is certainly new with genome sequencing, but, I mean, there was a time when we, you know, didn't understand some certain chromosome abnormalities and told people about a 
you know, an abnormality that then later was refined. So it's, it's, it is an old question, but I think the scale of it is very different now. You know, we're seeing this as a research or uh, opportunity or a problem, or at least a gap. Many people are seeing this as a business opportunity. So you sequence everybody's genome, and then when they get ready to be pregnant, you send them one type of variance, and then when they, you know, in midlife, you send them another type of variance. And so just, uh, just as an aside. Yeah. And just to follow up on Jonathan's, I mean, the discussion that we had previously was, was virtually always in the context of a traditional genetics visit. And we had a certain comfort level with uncertainty, and so we, we could always say, well, we'll continue to work with you on that. But again, as Robert pointed out, the model now is now going to be geneticist-focused, and that is a dynamic where there probably hasn't been that level of comfort. And, and of course, Robert, to your scenario, there's always the possibility that as we change more and more annotations, they have even another reason to go back. I, I, I just came in, so I'm just coming in, in, in on the end of this discussion, but I think I think I know what you're talking about, and I think there's an opportunity here, which is to to use the current system of, of indication-based testing, uh, you know, putting down an ICD-9 or ICD-10 code um, to say, you know, I want to do this test, and use that mechanism to essentially order the test result, which is already out there, and have it come back. And, and Mike, Mike and I were just whispering back and forth. The, he, he mentioned that when when guidelines changes change, um, there there can be some reevaluation that goes on in terms of w which cholesterol value, which type of cholesterol, which PSA. Et so so that's a good point. you know, and again, that's not you know. So it, there is some stuff there. Mm -hmm. Make sure he gets full credit. Um, well, and, and uh, just recently, you know, now fat in the diet is not so bad, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've known that all along. <laughs> Anything else on uh, on this one? No. Okay. Um, and this was this slide. We didn't change anything. Howard, did you want to change anything here? No, you're good. Okay. Um, this metrics and impact uh, didn't hear anything last night. And again, you know, this is not your last chance. So so you know, do take a look and give some thought to these. We'll we'll send these out uh, and around. Uh, no changes there, or on EHR functionality. Sorry for going through so fast, but as I said we have three panels to to do diversity. Yeah, so I didn't get any, any changes on those. All right, now, um, so we started this morning uh, talking about clinical workflow, ended up talking mostly about EHR integration, and, and came to the conclusion that clinical workflow really is a local problem and, and probably not one that we can contribute much to other than to say, you guys have a real problem. I uh, hope you can deal with it. Um, so so um, specific roles for us in, in, uh, in the area of EHR or EMR, um, agreed upon nomenclature for alleles that would help in pulling, uh, you know, pulling information by clinical decision support systems and other systems reporting and, and that sort of thing. Um, that seemed as though that were, was a, you know, sort of a, uh, not easy to do, but at least something squarely in, in our wheelhouse. Uh, would anybody disagree with calling that blue? You're, you're frowning, Carol, so maybe you don't think so. No, I think it's pretty, it's, it's well within NHGRI's wheelhouse. I just think that there are, there are a standard nomenclature gene and strain and allele nomenclature groups out there in the human and model organism communities that could be tapped into. And it's not necessarily the name of the alleles that's the important thing. Just like gene symbols change all the time, but those gene concepts have unique stable identifiers associated with them so that when you develop systems that compute over this information, you share those IDs which are not human readable. We heard this comment this morning. And the name can change depending on what's known about it. So there are systems in place already to kind of deal with this, and rather than try to reinvent the wheel, we should tap into the groups that are already working on this and sort of get them involved in, in, in addressing this particular issue. No, good, good point. Um, I, th I think we did hear in terms of some of the clinically relevant ones that there, there are multiple um, annotation or naming systems, particularly the star alleles in pharmacogenetics that have nothing to do with the standard ontologies, as I, as I understand it, in, in the experimental realm. Yeah, but, but I don't think that's any different than the other. There, there used to be a wild west of naming genes, right? And so it's, it might be the same wild west for alleles now, but the fact is that there are rules, um, existing rules, and at least in some organisms, and I don't know if the human gene nomenclature group deals with alleles or not, but the fact is I think we can tap into existing expertise and, and, and methods for developing these, these um, uh, 
these rules that will fit in well with things that are already in place? Yeah, I, I think the, the spin I might put on it is that, um, you know, we don't have a Hugo um, to sort of say this is what we're going to be doing in the naming thing. So is there a role for NHGRI perhaps to, as, because it has funding around so many different projects that are addressing this issue, to sort of take the high ground and say we really need to solve this. I mean the star allele issue, it's not just that the star alleles are there, it's that different laboratories report out the same star allele, but they use a different combination of variants to define that, and that's obviously not what we need to know in, in, in the clinical realm uh, to be assured of that. And so it, it, it's not just a matter of adopting existing nomenclatures because some of them are inherently flawed. Um, since this has come up again, um, I didn't mention it the first time, um, uh, Lisa Kalman at CDC has gotten a group, a large group of people together to comment on this issue with respect to pharmacogenetics. and. There's lots of members from CPIC and PharmGKB and international uh, groups to participate, so there should be a lot of consensus. Um, but they're, um, you know, putting together a manuscript that addresses these issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll say I think that the role is also to document what test was done, what was that test capable of detecting, what was it, you know, alternately not capable of detecting, uh, because when alleles are reported out, um, it, you know, it's not always clear what could have been missed um, or if a new test was done, what was, you know, what was changed. So at any rate, the, I think the, at least for pharmacogenetics, somebody's trying to come to the rescue. I'm just going to say that I think one of the, the issues around this is um, the decision of whether we report something out as qualitative or quantitative. Uh, so, for example, when we're talking about is it a high metabolizer or medium, that's like ordering the sodium and getting only the flag that says it's critical or normal. And so physicians can manage quantitative data, and fundamentally that those results are, are, are quantitative. And the same thing with, with next-gen sequencing, there's actually quantitative data behind that. And to um, boil it down to, you know, a single string of, of, of figures, um, uh, actually obscures some of the nuances that may be important in interpreting the result. Point. Uh, yes, Craig. So just one, within the workflow, this is just my ignorance, what's the time frame that this has to be done in to get this, to make it useful in this? And is that a role for NHGRI? Yes, I would ask the, the clinicians around the table who are, are dealing with this. Sure. I mean, obviously, the shorter, the, the better, but... Um. Well, it's, it's uh, dependent, and you know, we have patients at our place that are having surgery, and that tissue is being tested, and they are not going to be treated in the next three months while they heal. So you have three months to get the result back. Um, they have others that are in the ICU for fungal infection, and you want to know that data in 12 minutes or less. And there's there are assays that will give you a 12-minute readout for a very limited amount of genomics, and and everything in between. So it kind of depends on the context you're looking for. But, but I guess you, you could say, you know, what is, if not ideal, optimal, or what should be standard of care? And, and you think, I mean, most clinical tests a week seems long, um, and you probably wouldn't want to go much beyond that. I mean, is that something we should be aiming for, or is this not something we should, I mean, I know, I know there are groups that, and Stephen, please, please speak up, that uh, do it way faster than that. So. How could you help us here on, uh, on, on what we should be aiming for or encouraging? Um, I think a, a good concept is acuity guided, uh, that um, each patient has their own acuity of illness, and in some patients, uh, they're seen in ambulatory clinics, and you know they'll be seen once a month at most, but more likely several times a year. Whereas for inpatients, the acuity is different, and in intensive care situations, it can be different again, um, and so it really depends what the information is. Uh, what the acuity is, there are very few instances where it's, um, you know, 12 hours, uh, infectious disease is one, uh, really, but for genetic diseases, there aren't, there aren't that many. You can think of maple syrup urine disease where really a couple of days is very, very important, but there aren't too many others that are raised to that bar. And uh, the other issues are that 
often uh, patients are not referred by their physicians. Uh, so part of it is, is the physician behavior where um, it's an emergency because uh, consideration of a genomic test is, is uh, thought of so late. There are also some workflow issues around that, and, and having practiced in a rural environment, I know the, you know some of the problem is the patient may come for, for four hours away to see you, and you do a test, and then they have to schedule coming back to you whenever that result is back. And you know the faster it comes back, the easier it is to do. The more fresh the the the, the pre counseling you did is in their mind, and so there are lots of other reasons besides um, medical acuity to try to do the best you can to make it as short as possible. And I would suggest the process be you figure out what your ideal is and then peel that, peel back from there based on what is practical and feasible. And then Terry, behind you, I mean, for me recently in, in discussing, at least within Caesar, some of the discussions about turnaround time also get very linked to cost. And so there's always this, this issue of, well, this could be done in a different time frame, but there's a huge implication on what it would cost you. I think we do need to keep that in mind, that, that ideal is ideal in what, in what context. And, and, you know, not only cost, but accuracy. Um, and it, you, you may, you could give up, you know, a fast answer that's a variant of unknown significance, or you could really do a lot of tracking down, you know, genotyping other family members, that sort of thing, and, and get an answer two or three months later that is definitive. Just to follow, I mean, for, for me, the ideal is, you know, the genome is there, it's, it's electronically queryable and matched up with the current, um, uh, current interpretation data, so it takes a matter of seconds between when the physician enters the order and the result comes back into the electronic health record system. To me, that's the ideal. Um, Ellie, Ellie, do you have the code for, oh, never mind, somebody else. Oh, to turn on the machine. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So, so I can see the slides, um, and the, and the fifth, and the maybe you fifth can pass point. Your laptop around. Yeah, that's right. The fifth point is really a good one. Um, so, oh my word. So yeah, really. Um, so the the other other blue highlighted one is on joint training opportunities. So so can we in the EHR informatics space, um, you know, maybe in collaboration with BD2K, the National Library of Medicine, as they are reinvented, um, could we look at training opportunities um, in specifically electronic health records, um, and could, you know, could that be explored? It sounds like ACMG might have some activity in that space as well. Too. Right. Yeah. ACMG and EMEA, and actually Alexa and I had a chance to chat oh, at yeah. uh, break, um, and uh, she's uh, going to be joining uh, Bob Frymouth. And, I've been uh, invited to. Oh, You've been invited. Yet accepted. Yeah. No, I've already, <laughs> I, I've, I've accepted you, um, so welcome. Don't talk to him if you're not. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's, that's right. exactly I mean, the, there, the yeah, point yeah. here. So I, I operate on the same rules that Terry does. Um, so, um, but I think we'll, uh, w you could probably pass that off um, uh, for updates, uh, you know, to, to me. Uh, as a uh, as a report out, just to and, and uh, Alexa in particular because of her connection with some of the NLM uh, work, that's something that we don't have as much um, uh, experience with, and so that that'll be a nice uh, addition there. So. That would be super. And I think also we had talked yesterday a little bit about um, not only joint training opportunities, but you know, you know, could we develop fellow projects, you know, that, yes. that yeah, that, yeah. That, I mean, there, there are a couple of times we'll, we'll run up many times, we run up against real barriers and say, gosh, if only we had somebody to work, you know, for three months on such and such a topic and, and trying to find ways that we could encourage people to do that. With well, well, you're it's looking a, at those. So is that a mechanism so. that, uh, I'm just, I just, I want to follow specifically up on on that, so so short projects, small projects, types of things. Is that how so, does that work? So well, you know, there there would be a variety of ways one could do it. One one, you know, <coughs> as as you would do as a PI, if you have a thorny problem and you want to, you know, bring in a collaborator and say, let me support your statistician for three months or whatever, and that, and that, or you know, could that be a supplement, or could it be a, a way of shifting around funds and a grant? I mean, I think that the how is less important than than being able to understand okay. or being able to identify and make these links, and then we'll figure out how to make it work. American, American Society for Human Genetics has taken a real interest in, in this as well in the last year or so, so you can consider them as well. So, 
any sure I may not need to be in this space if there are, no, seriously, I mean, if there, there are this many groups that are, that are working here, um, you know, obviously we, we, we like to think we have a convening role um, and all, but we're also happy to have others convene and, and so maybe give some thought to whether there are other groups that should take the lead here. Um, so. Well, and certainly to the extent that um, at least uh, Amy is pretty well aligned with some of the uh, informatics fellowships, pro fellowship programs, um, you know, they might be an obvious place to yeah. take a lead on some of those. Mm -hmm. no, that makes perfect. Maybe where our role is, is is pointing out how they should be doing all of their work on our problems. That, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that could be a role for us. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, so I think we got, uh, oh yeah. Um, and then on, on the, the uh, also in relationship, and I'll, ch I'll change the name of this to e HR integration and that. Um, we, we just heard about exploring the, you know, balancing turnaround time um, with acuity cost and other, other needs, um, promoting software development for uh, presenting genomics to clinicians. Um, one that we, we heard multiple times was that, that while clinical workflow is always local, we could focus on tools that help to manage data in multiple settings, um, not, not necessarily at a, at a single uh, local one. Um, and that laboratory workflow may be more amenable um, for, you know, at least we could, we could develop some tools or, or work with ClinVar and, and um, uh, NCBI colleagues to facilitate ClinVar submissions. Um, and let's see, assisting new entrants, uh, building on tools and knowledge for more expert settings. So, so again, this was, you know, this is something, somewhat the Ignite model. It's almost, you know, the June 2011 colloquium model where we said, can we kind of lay out what it takes to be able to implement one of these programs in a new, in a new setting? Um, and then uh, building a, a better business case for EHR vendors, which is, a, again, a tough nut to crack, um, but uh, uh, ra rather similar to other NIH health economics efforts. Uh, yes? Uh, Terry, a comment prompted by the last bullet, but more generalizable than that. So one of the strategic questions about whether, where to put money is where the market is not going to solve the problems that are out there, right? So, um, and a couple of examples of that are things where the investment horizon is so long that uh, companies aren't going to be going, up, you know, like, there needs to be seed money to, to invest in things that are really way downstream and things where there isn't a business case for industry, where there aren't sort of market incentives to do things. But I think some of these things, like the last one, we, you know, we have a, hopefully we have a functioning market that should be able to solve that problem without a lot of uh, sort of public uh, direction or public push or public monies. And so some of the strategic questions come into like, you know, where can industry and the market solve these problems for us? Yeah, that's an, an excellent point, and, and you know, we're, we're, I, I think the, the intent of this bullet point, and, and I think it was Mark who suggested it, um, is, is maybe, you know, doing a better job of leading the horse to water, and, and you know, is, is there a way that, that our research can kind of point that direction? Was that reasonable? Okay. Great. All right, so that's the um, uh, MR integration. On the clinical, uh, clinician education, uh, we heard um, a, a number of challenges with the, with the ISCC. This is a, a society of societies that they encouraged us to, to form, um, but it is a, a sort of a volunteer effort, and probably at this stage, now that it's two plus years old or so, uh, needs to have a little more support than, than just what we can do, you know, if, uh, glean from the voluntary society. So we're, we're working on that. Um, this opportunity of the, uh, the UK effort, is, and I think Aaron it was who sent me, did you send me a link? Could you describe it? It's actually a very interesting model that they're, they're doing. Did you get a chance to read the link? Or? Oh, I just <laughs> skimmed through it. So it was the NHS um, Genomics Education Program. And, I mean, it looks pretty comprehensive. If you just Google that, that'll take you to the website. And, I mean, they're doing so many things. For example, any uh, clinician that uses their system gets free training in medical informatics. They're um, putting together, it's starting in September of this year, a master's in genomic medicine program that they're offering free, I think, to any of their providers. And they describe a lot of different activities. There's newsletters that go out that push particular topics that are of, of interest to the clinician, there, there's so much to do, I really couldn't um, yeah, well, adjust it, it all in a short period of time, but it, it looks pretty um, exciting and comprehensive. No, thanks. I mean, you, I, I think you've summarized it quite well, at least from, from what I was able to skim in a, in a short period of time. And, and boy, you know, if there are newsletters, for heaven's sakes, can we, you know, we have friends in England, um, can, we, can we get some of those? This, this master's program is really an interesting idea, um, and they're proposing to train, I read, 450 some, some um, clinician scientists in, in this area. That is really cool, um, and, and really something I think that we, we need to learn from. So I'm not sure, we'll have to talk within an HGRI as to, you know, 
where the nexus for that should should sit. I'm I'm thinking it might live in a division that has E in its name, um, <laughs> so, which is our our division of policy communications and education. But obviously, you know, it's relevant to all of us. So, okay, great. Um, the, the question, the, kind of the eternal, or at least a, a question that's been along, uh, around at least as long as I've been um, trying to encourage uh, genomic implementation of medical care is, is how can clinicians provide useful consultation without being board certified geneticists? And there, there clearly are ways of doing that. This master's program in, in Britain may be one way, but there, you know, there are folks currently who are doing this kind of, of work in, in a genomic consult service with, without um, that, that kind of uh, certification. So, so is this something that, that NHGRI or others can help to promote and, and encourage, because it, it does seem as though it's going to be needed, otherwise these results are going to be misinterpreted and misused, and then people will get discouraged and won't order any of them, and the patients won't benefit. Are you raising, yeah, Julie? Yeah, I, I, I really liked Howard's idea about sort of the CDE equivalent, because it really, I mean, there are certified diabetic educator. So, they, they, I mean, you know, a whole bunch of different type of clinicians can qualify for it. There are, there are clear standards about what you have to do. Um, I, it, it might be interesting to explore. Um, so it, there has been, and I think you heard from from some of the folks in the, in the on the ACMG side. There's been a lot of resistance to this idea from from that group, um, largely as I understood it, because it's a huge effort to to put something like this together and to maintain it and make sure that it's, you know, it meets standards, et cetera, and, and the estimated uptake was quite low. Now, now that may have been several years ago and things are much better now and, and that sort of thing, um, but it's, it, I don't think it'll be an easy slog. Uh, we also have a, a challenge in that we tend not to use NIH dollars for clinician education um, because otherwise we would be supporting, you know, educating neurosurgeons to make a million dollars a year and that wasn't felt to be a good use of the public funds. And so, so where, you know, where do we fit in, in this? Maybe, in, again, with our convening power and, and encouraging people to do it, but, you know, what role could we play? Uh, potentially in, in encouraging this kind of thing? Bob, well, I, th I think um, experimental studies are important. Uh, um, ours is, is looking exactly at this with primary care physicians. But I guess one of the more fundamental questions is, are we documenting anecdotes, of which there are many, uh, or are we really systematically finding out whether it is impossible to roll out genomic medicine with a modest amount of training, such as with the kinds of training uh, uh, organizations that were mentioned, such as, you know, uh, putting them into your reaccreditation or your specialty training. In other words, is this as big a problem as everyone in genetics is saying it is? And I'm not 100 percent sure that's true, and I think, I, I think this is heresy, but I, I think that, that clinicians, these things are going to diffuse out into the practice of medicine with early adopting clinicians first. They're, they will be able to use resources like genetic counselors and specialists the way they've used them. And I'm sure there will be some rough spots, but our medical system depends on generalists and moderate level specialists being able to titrate their degree of comfort with specialty situations. So I, I think one question is documenting this, doing this in experimental ways and documenting whether this is as problematic as we have all convinced ourselves that it is. It may I think, be. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. And, you know, right now there's a problem, but that doesn't mean five years from now there'll be a problem. And I, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, are we solving, are we fixing, are we filling the gap, or is there a, a need long term? And, and part of it's just us all guessing, but, um, you know, certainly uh, you know, when the diabetic educator part came out, and I am not one, so I don't, I don't know from an insider view, but um, the endocrinologists weren't all that in favor of it. And then as their workload went through the roof, they were the biggest supporters. Um, and it's something that's carried on just because the, the volume is, is, has, has been a problem. And I, and I think we're going to get a bit of that as, as um, some level of sequencing becomes normal, which it's not today, but as it becomes more normal, then I think there may be some level of sustainability there, but maybe not everybody. You know, so I, we'll have to see. I think one thing we need are a few more pilot projects. I mean. We're talking about impressions. We really need to generate some data around this. There are a few studies that are starting to do this, but I'm, I'm not aware of studies where we're really saying, okay, can we scale a genomic medicine 
in this uh, particular clinical application to 500 people a year or some significant number and then say what are the barriers to that and collect that evidence? Well, Geisinger's going to try it for sure real fast. <laughs> You know, in addition to, to Geisinger, to, to some degree, the eMERGE programs are, are doing this on a much more system-wide um, scale, as, as well as um, um, Ignite. But you're right, we need to collect data on them um, and figure out what the barriers are. Yeah. And, and this brought me to a point that it's not represented on the slide, and I think it should be, and, and that would be the NHGRI function of consolidating and aggregating a clearinghouse of all the materials that are being developed and all the approaches that are being developed, as well as how they're being studied. Uh, so that, again, uh, it's not just Emerge doing their thing uh, and Ignite doing their thing, um, but we can all contribute. And so if there's something from Emerge that says, boy, this looks great, I'm going to grab this for Ignite and use it, and we begin, again, to define not imposing a standard approach, but using best practices uh, and testing them in different settings to see how generalizable they are. And that's a relatively low resource investment cost, and you could even imagine uh, transitioning that into G2C2, where well, you create a repository. It seems like, it seems like what, what you're describing is G2C2. Yeah. Um, it is, um, but I think there's an intentionality related to your programmatic direction for the cooperative agreements, which is to say, if you're thinking about returning the results, here is a group of things that have been tested, and we want you to contribute A, and B, we want you to tell us how you went about testing the effectiveness of this particular intervention. So I think it's beyond just contributing things to a repository. It's really also show us your work. Well, you're... Oh, I, I was going to say one, one of the um, this morning I talked about what motivates providers for you know getting educated and uh, another question is what motivates us to think that they need education and I think one of the things that we fear is patient harm uh, and either from not having access to um, genetic testing or genetic medicine that would benefit them or from misuse of it uh, and that will harm them and so that's another sort of way to um, to, you know, a tunnel to look down is the patient safety uh, direction to think about um, an endpoint with respect to education. So this is not something NHGRI I can fix, but just in the context of this discussion, I sort of feel obligated to say it, and that is we would go a long way, I think, if we could figure out how to better empower uh, and appropriately bill for genetic counseling services. That would have a big impact in this area. Uh, that's a, okay. Uh, yes, Adam. So, <clears throat> I think I want to combine a little bit of panel seven and panel eight with this comment. But you know, we're talking about clinician education, and I'm thinking about how the electronic health record is going to be used in this manner. And I'm thinking about the knowledge vendors that are feeding that information into this. And we've already heard earlier in our in our discussion that not everyone's info button is pointing to the same place because there's a whole bunch of them. You know, whether you're using up to date or clinical key or any of the other probably half dozen that exist out there. And I wonder if there might be a need to sort of bring those players in to have a discussion about their best practices for actually collecting and utilizing the information that everyone in this room and hopefully everyone watching on TV is is helping to generate. You know, I wonder if we can start thinking about uh, feeding the knowledge base itself that's going to be uh, driving some of the clinical decision support that's going on, which will eventually lead into, into the clinical education. Buying knowledge bases? You, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like so that's a, that a, seems a, a little bit of a, of a big order, a tall order to me, um, but, uh, but maybe something that we could work with our partners um, in, in the IOM and, and elsewhere to try to address. So. I just wanted to pick up on a, um, a term that Robert used, uh, the early adopter, his view of diffusion and early adopters and so on, and it may not fit squarely into this topic, but um, it seems like... Um, this group represents um, a small fraction of the practice of medicine, uh, and the 95 percent of the practitioners are, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are <laughs> uh, of the groups you know participating in these programs are, are um, you know in the community and other places. And 
and I, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about how to, uh, is it a, a low cost but potentially high impact uh, opportunity is to really embrace the affiliates notion. So bringing in the early adopters um, you know, from the community to be part of uh, the programs here, a lot of them may find it quite attractive to just be with the cutting edge scientists and thinking about how to bring their local practices and, um, and community hospitals to be you know, at the cutting edge. It gives them a competitive advantage if nothing else and it may actually satisfy uh, an important aspect of their education and uh, intellectual challenges. So, so it's um, we, I don't, we haven't really talked about how do we do manage affiliates and, and across the uh, various NHGRI programs. But um, I know in Ignite we're we're really beginning to expand our repertoire into a lot of groups that are not funded by the program but um, are uh, willing to make contributions and participate. This is actually something that we borrowed, Mike, from ENCODE. Um, so, so the ENCODE project has had an affiliate uh, uh, approach, I think, for two or three um, renewals, if I'm not mistaken. And, and your, your notion, I think, was that they would, would contribute almost equally data sets and that sort of thing just on an unpaid un basis. Is that, maybe I'm describing it uh, poorly, but, uh, but there was a, there was a contrib you know, they had to contribute something as well as get something back, correct? Yeah, so ENCODE is an open consortium. That I think this is what Terry's referring to. And we have on the public website that if people want to join the project, they can. And it says, this, these are the expectations that the project would have that you would contribute. You would say what you do and the rules you would have to follow. But people could join without having been funded to be part of the project. I think there's another opportunity because um, there might be another tier of affiliates that just feel that they um, are attending almost uh, nothing else, a, a scientific meeting that's educating them about the way where the field is going and that could quite create quite a large uh, amount of value in its own right as in addition to having one uh, groups that are um, more willing to participate in the research agenda particularly if those who wanted to get could get themselves sequenced well We'll send them to you, Robert. Um, but but I, I think uh, you know we've we've done this in Emerge for quite some time. Is that what you were going to? Yeah. Why don't you comment on that? Because I've been talking a lot. So go ahead. Just that we have. I mean, the Air Force, for example, was I think our first uh, affiliate member, mm -hmm. um, and we actually we've just uh, worked out a deal with Encode to be a participating member as well. So I, I think there's a lot of value to that. The only danger to that is. The steering committee meetings grow quite rapidly. And we also have, and I sort of put affiliate slash associate, because we, we do have groups that, that just want to hang out with us. Um, and so, so there have been a couple of private hospitals from different, different parts of the, of the country that are really interested in, in what Emerge is doing. And, and they come, and eventually one of them, I think, became part of Ignite and, and that. So, uh, so yeah, so that's something we can do as part of our dissemination role. Because um, I was going to say that I do also think that's an important way to think about some of the dissemination opportunities outside of the major research universities and major research yeah. hospitals. Good point. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, and then another several bullets. Oh, I'm sorry, Wendy, I forgot. I'm sorry. Um, since we were going from, let's see, group seven and eight, how we can sort of cross what the groups are doing. I was going to go from group eight to nine and um, react to how strongly you know patients can be engaged in the process, either um, through patient advocacy groups or um, because they're early adopters themselves and they get the 23andMe test and go to their doctor. So using the patient engagement as a way to get the physicians engaged and the professional societies engaged could be pretty powerful. Um, one thing that I don't think came up but I find is a, a, a big issue in ISCC is engagement of physicians. Um, and so the, the use case which uh, Mark Williams uh, started and um, I took over with Reed Peretz, uh, you know, we're grappling to find use cases f which clinicians find important and useful in the context of their practice, and yet it's hard to have people come to the play, you know, and say, what do you, what do you really need? But um, if it's instead the advocacy group saying, my doctor doesn't understand anything about this important disease, Lynch syndrome, uh, or, you know, something a little more rare, um, if, if we combine those and prompt the physicians, this is what your patients are clamoring for that might be more powerful. 
Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting thought. You know, really talking about patient engagement. You know, some some patients, as you as you point out, are really quite knowledgeable. Sometimes they are the most knowledgeable people on the planet about about a given condition. Um, on the other hand, if it's that rare, it's very difficult um, uh, for us to engage. You know, your average physician in them. But but maybe gleaning from the patients. You know, what is it that you would want a physician, whether it was your disease or not? What would you want a physician to to know, to understand, to ask that that sort of thing? Yeah, I I think if they're rare cases are, are just used uh, in a way to generalize situations of, gee, this is rare. I don't even know where I would get started looking it up. You know, what are, what are uh, resources that I can really uh, respect and, you know, where do I get started? Yeah, we're, we're almost to panel nine, but we actually have another slide of panel eight yet. Um, and we have to get on to, we have to talk about next steps as well. Did you have a closing comment? No? You didn't. Okay. So, um, and then uh, uh, let's see. And again, you know, these start to look all alike, at least to me. Um, <laughs> so, so we'll we'll be sending them around to everyone. The two that that uh, sort of seem to stand out here a little bit um, was were the point was the point that the education around when to order the test is harder and probably more important than what to do with the results. Uh, I guess I, I, maybe not the more important part, but but probably the education about when to order is harder. Uh, would people tend to agree with that? Maybe that's an area where we should we should have maybe a little bit more focus than we've had in the past, because I think we've been focusing on returning results and not when, how to order. Mark? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight uh, the comment that Aaron made that we do, that you do have one project in the space that's actually studying this, and so perhaps a first step would be kind of a report out to the Genomic Medicine Working Group about some of the um, uh, learnings from uh, uh, from the early efforts. I know it's, it is early, but uh, uh, that could be informative. The other thing I just so, wanted so to... So I'm sorry, so the, the Aaron, so this is in ClinGen or a specific... No, this, no, this, is, this, is, this the is the SBIR grant that we oh, have for okay. Simul yeah. Consult. Oh, yeah. Thanks. And then the, the other thing I just wanted to clarify, um, uh, you know, Ruth had, had mentioned um, about info buttons being useful with laboratory reports, but info buttons can be used in the lab ordering system as well to say, to provide the information about how to order a test. So it's not that info buttons are only after the fact, they can be before the fact as well. Good point. Um, we also heard that, it, that we should have uh, more engagement with clinician end users as to what they need. I think we, we aren't doing a real good job of, of engaging. Um, so I, I think maybe on a, on a more local level uh, that, that is happening. And whether we're bringing that back in a more systematic way, I'm not so sure. So. Okay. And then moving on to participant engagement. Um, Again, just, just the highlights. Um, we, we noted, and you know, uh, perhaps shame on us or something that for us to tackle, there's little patient engagement in our genomic medicine programs, at least at the sort of systematic or, or overarching level. Um, while there is some going on locally, we could probably learn more from that, and there is there's more to be learned uh, there. Um, and uh, something we, we may not be doing as well as we should is, is developing tools in clinical settings and evaluating them in clinical settings. We're often doing the development evaluation sort of separate from that because you don't want to put it in a clinical setting until you're sure that it works. Uh, but, but given that you've, you've, you know, made that initial testing, then there needs to be further follow-up in a clinical setting. That seemed to be uh, what people felt was important. Uh, oh, and uh, that, that may be it. I thought there were two for participant engagement. I'm sorry. Um, so anything we missed in the participant engagement space or any, any here that you think would be um, important to highlight? Yes. Uh, well, just oh. the comment that I was making earlier, which was that um, when you're looking at your existing portfolio and sort of the requirements that you have on returning results and, and making sure that, that uh, patients, participants actually have access. Uh, to that data. And I know that it's a little bit fraught, but at least looking at that problem and how you could do that. I know it's fraught. Yeah, it is fraught. It, it, <laughs> but nonetheless, so it's... Patient access to data, we'll just leave that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah okay, but it is, it's a real challenge. Um, so I think then, given that, we have a very nice picture that we will share with everybody. Um, and we should talk a little bit about what we're going to do here in the, you know, our, sort of our next steps. So, um, <laughs> I, well, you know, I love, I, I like Caesar's Gallic Wars, what can I say? Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, we will certainly do a meeting summary, um, as we always do for, for these meetings, um, as well as, and, and this is, you know, next steps, guys, of course you know that. 
So next steps, um, a meeting summary that will be posted on our, our website. All The video, uh, uh, Alvaro and, and Chiara are incredibly fast at putting these videos together, um, and that will also be posted with uh, slides on our website. Um, and I do want to take a, a, just a minute to, to thank um, Alvaro and, and Chiara for the incredible work that they've done coming in early and late. <laughs> So that's super. Um, and then, you know, sort of what kinds of, of uh, hard products do we want from this meeting? Um, we sometimes do white papers. It seems like there might be a white paper in, in kind of what are the research directions, the new directions for, for NHGRI and others. We, you know, would never limit ourselves to our little teeny budget. We, we want to actually co-opt, you know, everybody's budget if we, if we can. Um, and so, so these can be long or short. Um, Howard and I were just kind of talking a bit, you know, the, the, the long version is like a 4,000 word review. Um, that was the Global Leaders paper that just came out, that was from our, our um, uh, GM6 meeting. Uh, and the original implementation roadmap, uh, both of those were long. The ISCC paper that Mike Murray and I did um, was short. That was 1,200 words, and it was really a very focused, very targeted thing. We're kind of leaning toward the 1,200 version, a 1,200-word version, you know, targeted in terms of what, what are the research directions, rather than trying to kind of review the field and, and that. Um, do people feel that's, is that a comfortable place to be? Okay. Um, and then the question is in terms of, Julie, oh, I'm sorry, Julie, go ahead. I didn't have a comment on that. Maybe the next point. So, well, in terms of an, in terms of an, a related, a, a different deliverable than a white paper. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that um, we heard, especially a lot yesterday, was, you know, how do across the different networks, how do we take advantage of, you know common measures or things that have been learned or whatever. So in a very specific context, um, my understanding is Emerge 3 will be constituted soon. Um, Ignite meets next week. And, and so, you know, probably some of that is easier to do as new networks are reconfigured or whatever. And I mean, maybe you would want to make a charge to Ignite and the other networks to provide input to emerge of things that they could think about adding, well, think about that, doing collectively. It's timely because I think in September the plan is for Emerge and Ignite. January. January. Yeah. Emerge and Ignite are going to actually have a joint meeting. So. Right, but I think as Howard was saying, if you do these constant one-off meetings, this group with this group, it, it's impossible to cover all the possibilities. Um, so, so, you know, it, it might just be an opportunity to charge the other networks to think about what are things that, common measures that they have or things that they could share and Emerge could disregard them or not. But um, it might be a way to sort of start that collective. Sure. Process. No, that's a, that's an interesting idea, and, and you know maybe asking each of the of the programs to, to recognize okay the, the mission of this program is this, but within that mission are there are there things that are, are relevant to the work that you're doing that you'd really like them to highlight, or you know where there are commonalities because there are many, um, you know can we do some things in you know joint or collaborative ways? So but, and maybe at the at the least we should ask the the representatives from each of these groups that were here at this meeting to. Uh, actively feedback, uh, mm. you know, maybe wait till the meeting summary exists, but, you know, because there are sometimes, you know, I, I don't know what you, what your, I don't, I'm up in you on spot, but like, I don't know what your plans were, but it could have been that you thought, you remembered it, or it could be that you've been charged with reporting back. It's a very different scenario. Right. Right. Um, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that would at least step towards that, but I do agree that uh, if it's, if it's carefully thought through, mm -hmm. um, Having people actively look at or at natural collaborations, mm -hmm. um, I don't think forced ones would be in these. Yeah. Steve, yeah, you know, to build on that, it, it's been a bit frustrating for me at this meeting to learn about how much is going on across consortia that I'm not involved in that overlaps with the things that are going on at the consortia that I am involved in, and that, that we're all sort of you know feeling around the elephant from our own consortium's point of view, and I am wondering how much thought has been given in the past to. Uh, you know, it's an approach to informed consent or an approach to actionability or an approach to electronic health records that it doesn't happen consortium by consortium, but that there's a single informed consent group that all of the consortia can participate in if it's relevant to the aims of that 
uh, consortium. I, I'm, certainly not add, I'm certainly not suggesting adding another layer of groups on top of the existing groups, but rather something that crosses consortia that replaces the sort of group by group consortium by, by consortium approach that we have right now. Um, Lucia, do you want to speak about the actionability group as a model of that? Yeah, we can say a little bit about that. So we have a um, voluntary interest group called the Actionability Interest Group. It's um, open to currently to members of NHGRI consortia that are doing research in the area of actionability and return of results. And we meet um, once a quarter, actually. Um, and it's completely investigator driven. So we've had presentations from um, Emerge, from CSER, from ClinGen, um, from Ignite, I think, and, and it's just a good opportunity for people to just convene and, and um, hear what other colleagues are doing. I think we've tried to keep it low burden, so sometimes people tend to forget that we have them, but we have, for example, been able to tackle issues like FDA, IDE regulation, so we had a series of you know investigators present on that, and then um, in the next one, we'll have the FDA come and talk with us. So that that, that is one model. Um, we've had a, you know two to three dozen people, um, including NIH staff, on those calls. Well, and, and also, and, sorry, go ahead. Who's that? And also, oh, Emerge and the Caesars, they have, we have joined the group uh, teleconference. If we lie, we have some common issue among these different consortia. We can have the joint teleconference we, um, monthly or quarterly that can share those um, basic or common issues. Charlie, Jeff actually has a yeah, um, and, and don't take this the wrong way. I hope I say this um, tactfully. Terry, you've done an amazing job <coughs> in... <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in, in taking us from uh, GM1 to GM8, and I'm looking at these nine slides, and I'm wondering whether you have enough staff to help with the oversight of everything that we're talking about and bringing together the different groups, as others have suggested, it just seems like now is a time to potentially take a step back and look at how this can actually work. So, so the answer to your question is no, um, and, and you know, and I, and I won't turn to the gentleman to to my left and say, Eric, you got to solve this problem. Oh, well, um, the Rex. Uh, because, yeah, I had to do that. be clear. Because, Come on, Rex. because in, in his defense, I think at GM four was it? Eric said, Terry, how are we going to handle all of these things that are spinning off of this effort? And and this has been a you know a source of perennial anxiety for us, and yet it is it's you know really important work to be done. So, so there are some things that we do need to spin off and, and have other groups take on. Uh, unfortunately, or, or you know, fortunately for the Global Collaborative, that has been one that we've just not been able to be as active in as, as we had been in, in previous ones. And so, so we've made some choices, not because one area is less important than the other. It really has, has had to do with timing and, and workflow. But, but that being said, you know, are, are there ways we can leverage the kinds of things we are able to do and, and choose? We, we need you guys to help us prioritize, so we'll be sending these around, and that's a, another I, I, I left that out. Um, so, so we. And then there's precision medicine. Oh God, <laughs> let's, let's not even talk about um, lists for priorities. So we will ask you to, to do that. Um, but yeah, and, and I think the other thing, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday. You know, it's it's hard enough for for applicants to you know run the gauntlet of getting funded in that and and, and get their grant, and they have their project that they need to do, and then we ask them to participate in a consortium where they not only have to do what they said they were going to do, but as Dan diplomatically called it, the unfunded mandates of, of cross-consortium, you know, uh, 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 common elements and other things, then to ask those consortia to participate in consortia of consortia, you know, you, you sort of feel like you've just got everybody kind of going around in circles. And, and so, we, so we need to find a balance there. And I think this idea of, you know, if there's a topic that really is overarching across all and is not the primary mandate of one where they are so responsible for it that, that you know, they live or die if, if, if it gets done and the others could be, could come along or not, you know, maybe those are places where we can look for, for groups that would be cross-consortium. And we would rely on you all who are participating in those programs to identify those for us. So, so give some thought to that as well. Yes. So come, come back to Steve's uh, point, I, the, this, is, this is reactive, not, not uh, really planning ahead, but uh, some of the groups have some natural overlap because there's single institutions involved in, in multiple. Yeah. And so there, there's an inbuilt liaison. And, I'm wondering whether some of the groups that don't have that need to think through, do they want to have liaisons to some of these, you know, some of the natural partners? It, it's not ideal, but if there was somebody, I, I don't know which group uh, you were re uh, referring to, but if there was somebody who's, you know, part of their job voluntarily was to 
go in and listen in on the, and be in on the calls or go to the meetings or whatever um, and report back in a very active mode, you know, maybe some of those missed opportunities would be found. But it, there's always going to be a problem of so, missed opportunities. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about something more fundamental, which is to replace the idea of liaisons and replace the idea of sort of voluntary second layers of groups that we can choose to be on or not in addition to our own consortium groups with, for those topics that are truly cross-cutting and that affect, maybe not all groups, but many groups, electronic health records, informed consent, actionability. Those are sort of long-standing challenges that we face as a community. And why not have one set of groups that address them that people can plug into from any of the consortia? Just a single layer. I'm sorry? You know, you know, one of yeah, the things, sure. yeah, one of the things we've really tried to do, we did this in the, in the GWAS era, was, was, you know, anybody could come in and sit and listen to our, our association analysis calls because we wanted everybody to learn how to use these things. Um, you know, maybe something we should do, I, I think it's, it's very useful to, for, to, to webcast these meetings. It, it takes, obviously, a tremendous amount of time for, for our staff and, and, and costs and other things to do that. Uh, WebEx is not terribly uh, expensive, and those can be recorded, so might we consider um, and, you know, making those available, see, see if people look at them or not. But, uh, but I, I know we use WebEx for many of our, our meetings just to facilitate them, and maybe that's a way of at least having, having some record or something that people can come back to. Yes? I was going to say to the point that, you know, that grid that we've seen a number of times where each of the site or each of the projects and what they were sort of involved in is sort of the starting point for what are the cross-cutting topics, and we could maybe redistribute that to the various programs and make sure that everybody's on board and has filled in all the blanks. Because I don't, I don't actually know how that matrix got generated, but I could envision that some of the groups in looking at them might add X's that they think they're involved in. Well, I pointed yeah. to you, but it's probably should point at Jackie. No, no, I, I, you know, I that, one, that one I didn't leave to Jackie. So, so that was on my patio a couple of Saturdays ago. I right. mean, frankly, that's you know what yeah. what we did. We asked each of the groups to to identify their objectives and their barriers, and then and then I just tried to pull it together. So it has had absolutely no curation. Do not blame Jackie for that. Uh, <laughs> so, so it would have been much better. Um, but I, I I think you're right. What we should do is redistribute that and and have people you know add to it and correct and and particularly if there are areas that you know if there's there's something that's something touches on, it's good to note that. But if there's something that's really an emphasis, you know, I think maybe we want to have like one plus and two pluses or something like that. And I saw a hand, was it Janet's hand? Or some, somebody's hand up there? No? I was hallucinating. I was oh, just and I was trying to ignore Mark. But I know I you were. Yeah. Uh, good luck with that. And Janet's been trying to do that for 37 years. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I can speak up here. <laughs> no, I think um, one of the categories actually that I would add would be um, some more information about patient engagement and uh, activities, uh, specifically right now it's lumped together, clinicians and patients, and maybe to separate that out would be helpful. But I think that the, um, the, the objectives and barriers grids are the, would be the basis for the survey that would go out afterwards, because in addition to making sure that we mark it up correctly, like we're in this space or we're not, but that could easily lend itself then to how important is the issue and then how tractable is the issue to solve have people rank on both of those, and then you could uh, begin to aggregate across. Same thing with the barriers. You know, how important is this as a barrier? How easy is it to solve? Um, and uh, th that would be a, a nice framework to work off of. Um, so again, almost there, we were talking a, a little bit about um, uh, having a white paper, and, and I, I realize, you know, you wonder, are these really useful? I, I am told that they, are, they do tend to be used by groups who are trying to do this kind of work, and so it's, it, it feels like a dissemination activity that we should do. Um, so what, what I would propose is, is that, you know, Everybody who was a, a panel, uh, a panel member or a moderator, um, uh, which is sort of everybody around this table, would be a co-author. If the if the journal will accept that, depending on the journal, some of them for the short reports, they'll only take two two authors. In which case, I would propose it be Howard and me, since Howard had to put up with me for all all through with uh, with doing we'll, this. We'll meeting. go for the uh, bigger group. Yeah, but let's go, let's try for the for the bigger one. Are, are people amenable to that? And, and then recognizing that if your name is on a paper, you have to have participated um, by IC, IJ, CME rules or whatever they are. Um, Not just correct your middle initial. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it would be nice to do more than that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, but I, but we do need to hear back from you um, if if you're if you're going to be a part of a paper. And so so please don't be offended if we try multiple times and and if you don't respond, we, you know, we have to drop you. So um, anyway, I think that's everything. Um, any other next step? 
perhaps we, we well, we heard, uh, and actually, Pierre, please go ahead. I was just going to uh, read out my action list that I'm going to take back to Canada. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, for, first of all, thank you so much uh, again for inviting me. It's been a very enriching uh, experience for me, and I've, I've learned a lot. And I think there are several things that I'm, I'm going to take back to both uh, uh, Genome Canada and our colleagues uh, in CIHR. CIHR are very involved in all the training aspects of uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, and so um, I think, uh, you know, looking at uh, the EHR issues, uh, and there are, Canada is um, it's certainly not a model for you. <laughs> Uh, it's very, very uh, complex, uh, very fragmented, uh, and I, I think we're, we're, we're not where we should be. Um, but I think we can certainly, I think in terms of the education and training piece, I, th I think there are things that could be done uh, together. Um, very interesting discussion around the genetic counselor uh, piece. I, I think this is something where we share a lot of the uh, of the of the issues. Uh, we don't have enough genetic counselors, for sure, in Canada. Also, the genetic counselors in the states, I think, are more empowered than uh, ones in Canada in terms of being able to order genetic tests. Uh, no, Mark is uh, shaking his head. No, genetic counselors don't have prescriptive authority, and so while they actually do all the counseling around the tests and may make specific recommendations about the test, it does require a physician order. Is that right? Not, yeah. not in every system or in every state. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, I it's, 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 They can it's, practice independent in, in most of the states. In yeah, most they, states. They can have private practices. Okay. But they just that's, can't order It's regulated at the state. state level as opposed to national, so that there's a lot of variability. Got it. Okay. 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 So it's um, not that great. Let the man but there, finish. Would you but please? there, I, th I think there's a, a, maybe a lot of cross fertilization that we could look at in, in that space because it's, it, we've certainly identified it as a key space and we want to encourage genetic you know, counselors to get involved in our own projects and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the other link is that I've noticed that the, the president elect of the National Society for Genetic Counselors in the States is actually going to be a Canadian. Uh, so that's very good. First, yeah, so I think it's the first Canadian that's, uh, that's uh, been nominated to that position, so that's nice. Um, and then the, the last thing might be around um, industry links. So uh, there, there are, other, you know, one of our big programs, it's not in our genomics and personalized health, uh, but we uh, have uh, coordinated from Canada the Structural Genomics Consortium, and this is uh, an international uh, partnership between, well, the leads are in Toronto and Oxford in the UK, but uh, there are uh, not 10 pharmaceutical companies that uh, have been investing in this with no intellectual property uh, position taking since 2004. And they've all come back and said, we're putting in another $4 million for phase four, which will be phase four of this structural genomics consortium. And I can tell you that most of the heads, the R&D leads of the, of the pharma guys are based in the United States. Uh, so I think there are potential links that, that we could uh, explore through that. Uh, and oh, yes, and there's now a node uh, of the SGC that is um, being spun out of GSK in uh, North Carolina and uh, I think will be based within the university campus or something. So that's something to look at, uh, uh, look at uh, for as well. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, I think the, the links with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a critical one for us, for sure. But I've noted that, you know, we, we should be encouraging that group not to reinvent the wheel. And if there are things that they should be using in terms of APIs or other things that already exist, we should know about them and we should, we should encourage them to, uh, to use those. But I think we're, uh, you are sufficiently linked in with that group. Uh, I'm, I know that some of you have already gone to Leiden for the, the meeting, uh, whenever that was, today, or it's today, yeah. Um, uh, uh, 
Uh, and uh, once again, you know, I will make sure that I'd be linking back in with um, CIHR in terms of the more of the training stuff, the EHR stuff, and, uh, and other items that will certainly in be of great interest to them. So thank you again for uh, inviting me. No, thank, thank you so much for coming. We, we appreciate it. Um, did you want to comment on that, Jeff? Yeah, I just I, I also wanted to thank you as well for, for being part of the panel yesterday and also for your input, uh, Pierre. Um, I wonder if uh, you would consider um, two things. One is uh, once you have a chance to bounce these uh, uh, concepts off here for your colleagues, uh, s setting up a, a telecon or something to think about ways to, to really um, enhance the partnership, um, which I think uh, we're, we're, we're hoping will, would be the case. Um, and secondly, uh, I wonder if, um, particularly GAPH, uh, running in parallel with um, a number of the programs here, whether there's a, uh, uh, whether it's appropriate to think about a joint scientific symposium that really showcases what's going on in, in both programs and, and maybe to um, reinforce some of the potential for collaboration. Both great ideas, uh, Jeff, and I'll certainly uh, follow up with those, yeah, for sure. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, the, I, I think this brings us to the end. We promised that we'd end on time and we're a little bit late. Um, uh, just a, a quick reminder that, uh, that we did also talk about having a GM9 uh, um, as, a, as sort of a basic science collaboration meeting and, a, and another scientific meeting that we would find a way to, uh, to encourage be funded. And Eric, did you want to make a point? No. Thank everybody for a great couple of days. Uh, we'll be following up with you and uh, safe travels. Thank you. Take care. Give ourselves a round of applause.